Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest today is Karen Fryer, Chief Financial Officer of Benco Dental, a third generation family owned nationwide distributor of dental supplies, equipment, and consulting and equipment services. Karen, welcome to the show. Thanks, Laura. It's great to be here. You know, Karen and I have, have had a long and kind of funny relationship in that we started working together, I guess, about five years ago now. And it was just as we were just getting to know each other, Karen said to me, well, I just want you to know that I'm pregnant and I'll be going on maternity leave in a couple of in a, a couple of months. And I said, actually, that's good because so am I. And the two of us basically shared that right from the beginning. And it was an instant bonding experience well above and beyond the typical professional. So, uh, Karen, how old are your kids now? Uh, so I actually have three kids. So I have a daughter um, who's six, a son who's four, and I have a new baby who's a little over a year old. And so that's got to be easy, right? Uh, two young kids and a baby and, oh yeah, CFO of a huge corporation. Yeah, piece of cake, piece <laughs> of cake. I'd say, you know, when you and I first got to know each other and our bumps were growing, you know, our connection <laughs> just, you know, became stronger. But I, I'm very lucky. My kids are excellent. You know, they always say, uh, I would say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And, you know, being a mother has definitely taught me a lot of great things. What's your favorite thing to do with your kids when you're not working? Uh, playing Mario Brothers. So oh. we found our new passion during COVID. So <laughs> I was one of the lucky few to find um, a new Nintendo and Target. I walked in one day, I saw it, I picked it up, and now we're uh, Mario enthusiasts. And my son, my four-year-old, is getting everything and anything Mario for Christmas, um, <laughs> got for Christmas. A new generation has been born yeah. of Mario fans. That's great. Yeah. So tell us a little bit. As you're in your role as CFO at a dental supply company and dental services company, who do you need to influence? Um, great question. So I'd say, you know, the short answer to that is everyone. And it starts in, in the morning. So going back to my kids, I have the three kids and I need to communicate effectively with them to how to brush their teeth, you know, no pun <laughs> intended. I need to find ways to help them understand the importance of brushing their teeth and getting to school on time. So I must say that's probably the most difficult communication task of the day. <laughs> but it goes back to, you know, in my role as CFO, um, needing to communicate to everyone. Finance has influence across the whole organization. It goes to the 1,500 associates that we have, up to our two managing directors, as well as our board of directors. I need to influence my team to understand what we're doing, why we're doing, how do we need to meet the needs of the organization, how do we need to continue to evolve to help support and then it goes to my peers, how do we, you know, work together and influence each other on how to make different investments for the organization? So I'd say the short answer is everyone. Yeah. So out of if you had to pick who's a harder audience to get through to, to, to convince and persuade of what you need them to do, the kids or the board? Uh, definitely the kids and my middle <laughs> child. So my son, he takes a little bit after me. Oh, He's, does he? Um, In what way? Uh, he knows what he wants and he's going to go after it. So, is he uh, pretty dissuasive? Like if he keeps getting the answer that he doesn't want, he'll pretend he didn't hear it and ask the question for a 400th time, assuming maybe this time it'll change? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I think our, our boys are, are relatively similar that way. Mine just keeps pretending like, no, I didn't ask it the last 399 <laughs> times. So let's try it again. They're going to wear you down one way or another. Sometimes they just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> so then what's the biggest communication challenge that you or the organization are facing today, aside from trying to persuade four-year-olds to do things that they don't want to do? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, thinking about this is that it's definitely, we never thought we'd have to face operating an entire remote workforce. So the entire nation went um, remote back in March and there was things that we just didn't have to think about. And I've encountered the lack of personal one-on-one -on -one collaboration, be it in a meeting or popping in someone's office. And we find ourselves jumping from meeting to meeting. And my team often talks about it of being Zoom fatigued. I'm a big advocate, get on video, let's see each other, let's talk to each other. But Zoom fatigue is a real thing. I was on a meeting a couple months ago and with my team who've leaned in so hard during the crisis and they just look tired and worn out. And I'm like, what's going on guys? And you could tell that just going from meeting to meeting um, is a real thing. So it's really important to take time, recharge, re-engage, take time off and connect with families, get 
off your, get out of your desk, get off a of Zoom and, you know, go for a walk. As a leader, I think it's important to balance the need for meetings and also limiting that amount of screen time. Yeah. And then, of course, making sure that the meetings that you're having are effective, which is surprisingly not as intuitive to do virtually, even if it's the same people you've been meeting with for a decade, you still need to manage it a little bit differently when it's virtual. I think people don't necessarily get that and they're not really clear on how to do it in, in a way that is engaging and that is going to be as efficient um, and as meaningful when it's through the virtual meeting. Hence, a lot of the Zoom fatigue that comes in. It's like, well, we keep meeting and meeting, but it doesn't feel the same. Why not? Mm -hmm. Do you find that? I do. And you find little tips along the way of how do you throw in, you know, five minutes in the meeting to do a little icebreaker mm -hmm. um, or just different things to actually lighten the mood um, because people are in their houses. I mean, my full team has been remote since March. They're in their houses looking at the same four walls. So how do you, how do you, I'd say spice it up to, you know, keep the, the motivation going and it's not easy, right? What's your best one or two ways that you've uh, you've had to loosen people up in the meetings? Re I like to call it humanizing the meetings. Humanizing the meetings is definitely important. Um, we had actually uh, a happy hour. So we do different happy hours and they're even a challenge at times because you know, you're asking people to go back on Zoom. But I got this from one of my peers in IT um, to show a photo of yourself. So go back 10, 15 years ago bring a photo and show it to your team. And it was just amazing, the photos that my team brought. Um, my treasurer had brought, you know, uh, 15 years ago of his wedding or when he went on his honeymoon. It was just, it was, we laughed for an hour and it really, you know, humanized ourselves, brought back the energy. And, you know, you just see the smiles across the face. It was priceless. People have come up with some really creative ways to to humanize the meeting and to reconnect with people. And photographs are such a great way to do that. I think it's almost like show us your high school yearbook photo or something. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're if you dare, <laughs> and dare. as long as of course the the, the video is not being recorded, I think yes. that would be the important one. I, there are certain photos that I do not want to have immortalized uh, for the world to see. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. So in order to get to the C-suite, and you had a really important journey in particular from your full career trajectory on your way up. Um, tell us a little bit about that journey and the, the path that you took and what specific communication skills you had to learn to get there and be successful. Yeah, um, so I spent my whole professional career out of Benko. I actually started as an intern within our finance team. Spent my whole career, really, I would say, on the P&L side of the house, really in core accounting, closing the books, moving my way through the analytics team, and then eventually to my role uh, about four years ago. It was a great journey. I've had a lot of great leaders and mentors along the way. I worked hard. Um, but I had a lot of great um, opportunities to get involved in different projects that taught me different skill sets as I elevated up through, through the organization. I would say one of the most critical communication skills I had to develop over the years was being succinct and developing powerful messaging versus long window explanations. Us as finance people, um, you know, we go into a, a meeting with a 50 slide deck with screenshots of Excel. Um, and as sure as you many know, when they do a company update, those are the ones that I don't get a lot of questions. So I really lost the audience immediately. Um, fast forward to today, I still walk in the room with 50 slides, but I've learned the art of how to create the story, how to walk my audience through the information, what's important to them, why is it important to me, why should it be important to them, and then have higher level strategic conversations that we need to have to move the company forward. Um, Another huge component of communication is influencing others, just as having a good sense of who the audience is. It's something I've really had to learn over the years. What's important to a room of IT professionals is not important to a room of sales reps and definitely not mm. important to the room of board of directors. So how you weave it all together and craft that message, I would say in a very succinct way that resonates with the audience is something that I've learned and mastered over the years. Yes, and that's something that so many people are struggle with on a daily basis. How do you translate your content to someone who doesn't have the background? That that's so critical, and that, that the death by PowerPoint is is also something that. Uh, goes above and beyond and certainly contributes to the Zoom fatigue, to say the least. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with people in, in the finance and accounting world, and they'll put up a screen that has a spreadsheet on it, and they preface by saying something like, you probably can't see this very well, but, and my first thought is, <laughs> oh my gosh, if you know this going into it, 
Why are you putting it there? Why, if I can't see it, and if you're looking at it on your own screen and you're using eight or 10 point font, once you do a screen share on top of it, it's not even going to take up your whole screen. It's, it's your, there's the screen and then there's the Zoom or virtual communication platform. And then there's the shared window and then there's the slide within it. So it's only going to be about half the size to everybody else of what you're looking at in the first place. So if you're looking at it and you can barely see it, it's like almost like you, a good rule of thumb is if you can stand six feet away from your computer and still read it, it's a good font. But if you That's can't- definitely a good rule of thumb. Then yep. uh, otherwise there is no excuse for starting any sort of screen share presentation, conversation or otherwise with, you probably can't see this, but if you need to say that, or if you're even thinking it, go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. So thank you for bringing that up. That's one of the things that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand. <laughs> but I got that off my chest. I'm glad uh, I could do that for you. What's the, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Then let's look at the other direction. What's a mistake you made, a communications related mistake or a lesson that you had to learn the hard way? And if you could go back and do it over again, what would you do differently? That's a good question. So it's ironic when you look back at your career and you think through the mistakes, um, they truly, I believe, help you become of who you are today. It's difficult to single out one single instance. I've definitely had my email snafus or, I t or the text message, but for fortunately for me, nothing too harmful that, you know, that I would say became a bigger issue. Um, so, but when overall mistakes do happen, I really focus on the learning since there's a lesson in everything. I would say one mistake that I've made recently has definitely been during the COVID period. Um, I didn't, I was not as candid as I needed to be with my team on a timely basis. Like every organization, we were juggling with a hundred balls in the air. We were on a rocket ship with no lights on and trying to guess what was next. Um, so during this time, there was projects that were coming left and right at, at us. And I really didn't want to overwhelm my team. I didn't want to overwhelm them with all the different scenarios and the projects we needed to do as I needed them to work through the projects that they're working on. So at that point, I was not as candid as, you know, as we were solving this, there was 10 other things that were piling up. So while my intentions were absolutely from a good place of protect of protecting them, my delivery really missed the mark. And the lesson as I sit back and reflect on it is no matter how much is being thrown at you or thrown at your team, it's always, always um, the right thing to do is to give people the full picture as soon as possible. What's the next big goal for you, Karen, whether personally or for Benco overall? And what communication skills will you personally need to continue to develop to achieve that goal? Um, I'm a very much work in progress, uh, whether most of us like to admit it or not, we all are. So I've been in my CFO for a couple of years and I wanna really keep that mindset that it's my first day and focus on the areas where I can improve and have the most impact. Uh, I would say my next goal is to be a mentor to others and develop that next generation of leaders. I was very fortunate to have many great mentors and leaders in my career, and I feel it's my duty to pass that on to the next generation. It's very challenging out there for young adults and kids right now, and they, they truly need the help. They need the advisory help. They need to think through things and, you know, get to understand real life after, after school. I sit on a local college advisory board and a nonprofit leadership group. And each year we mentor over 100 kids that are really beginning to map out their college, their careers. And we do a lot of work of leaning in and giving them guidance. And it's not rewarding only to the students, but it's so rewarding as a leader and for me personally as well to help out um, individuals and to mentor them. Oh, that's awesome. Because we want to make sure that as you're mentoring them, that we give them lots of communication skills training and yep. some good direction on that too, which is great. So we'll, we'll all evangelize and preach that gospel little by little. I love it. Then this brings us to the Listener 24-Hour Influence Challenge. Given everything we've discussed so far, this is your chance to speak directly to our listeners and to challenge them to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours to have more influence. How would you like to challenge our listeners today? Um, good question. So, you know, the holiday season just passed. It's It was time for family, time to connect with those that meant the most to you. We just celebrated a new year. And as I reflect on my journey and talk about mentorship, I would say my challenge is for all the listeners out there to go out and connect and say thank you and retain, return the favor to someone that's meant something to you in your 
to you in your career. Um, it could be a previous team leader, someone mentoring you today. It could be someone in your family or someone in the, commun in, in the community. And it goes back to keeping a line of open communication and appreciating those around you goes a really long way in helping your career. And at the very least, you know, it could brighten someone's day because you never know what kind of day they're having. That is for sure. The, uh, so, okay, the idea is to go back and thank someone for anything, doesn't matter for what, but someone you didn't thank previously, just make an effort to reach out to them, whether or not you've seen them in the last five minutes or five years, reach out and say thank you. Did yes. I get that? Yep. I love that. That's a beautiful spirit of generosity. Okay, everybody, you've got your marching orders. <laughs> so reach out to somebody and just say thank you. That's lovely. All right. Going on to the next part of the interview, we've talked a little bit about your journey. Now let's talk about how you guide others on the journey. When you think about executive presence, otherwise referred to sometimes as command presence or leadership presence, what does it make you think about? So one of my mentors offered me a great piece of advice a few years back, and it stuck with me and it still sticks with me to the day, this day. And it's you're most on stage when you're least on stage. And what it means in relation to executive presence is being authentic, approachable, connecting with others, even if you're or I'm having a difficult day. And it's how I evaluate it in others. I've had many opportunities to be in the presence of some amazing leaders. And what I've really noticed is that a truly great leader are those ones that really take the time to learn everything about their teams and every person that they've encountered throughout the day. They truly remember that, you know, people are people. It's a famous saying I say, uh, I say people are people and everyone has a voice. And I think about this often when we're at the Benko annual holiday party. Um, we didn't have one this year with COVID, but our managing directors are up on stage announcing winners of gifts. And they're not calling out the names, but telling stories of the people that win the awards. So it's not Jane Doe, come up and get your TV, but it's they're telling people about their backgrounds, the personal information, family, and they're not reading it off note cards. They've really taken the time that they um, have generally connected with the people. And you could tell there's a true connection there. And to me, that's defining characteristic of executive presence, but really the essence of an amazing leader. Do you know your people? That's so important to you. Do you, especially if it's people you encounter on a regular basis, you sort of need to demonstrate that you know who they are beyond what their job is. And uh, I think to the extent that you can show that you even know the people that you don't encounter that often. Do you know people's names? Do you know anything about them? Have you made those personal connections? Uh, that is definitely something that people often find more difficult than you would think. So I mm -hmm. totally agree that that's a great thing to be mindful of to to up that, that um, reputation and that, that your ability to connect with others that way. So what about succession planning? When you're grooming a high potential employee or looking to hire somebody externally for a leadership role, what are the most important communication skills that you look for? And on the flip side, what's a red flag that could derail that person's chances? Um, so I would say from the most important is definitely eye contact, positivity, enthusiasm. So from an eye contact, as I'm talking with someone, I want to make sure they're paying full attention to me, that they're leaning in, actively listening, engaging, asking me questions. Um, but really eye contact is important. Positivity and enthusiasm. So can they carry on a conversation to me that's not particularly related to the interview if I'm interviewing someone? Are they positive in their responses as they go through their career or looking at new projects? Are they not necessarily pointing the finger but being positive and enthusiastic for what's either upcoming or what they've accomplished? Um, so I would really say it goes back to eye contact, positivity, and enthusiasm. So then if I flip over to what's a red flag, it's really, you know, are people talking about others when they're not in the room? Mm. So it's negativity is a powerful emotion. I often say negativity and toxicity spreads like water. And I've continued, like I've encountered people where they point out the worst in every situation or they assume failure before something is attempted. So it's definitely a red flag um, from negativity perspectives. Yeah, the what do you say about people when they're not in the room? That's that's mm -hmm. important. Of course, the flip side of that that I hear often is what do people say about you when you're not in the room? That's really the truth about who who you are, but and your reputation, your image as a leader. But yeah, just watching how they talk about others uh, for I think for a number of reasons <clears throat> that in part 
yes, you want to see what that person's attitude really is, but it's also a good indicator that if they talk like that about everybody else when they're not in the room, you can uh -huh. pretty much guarantee that that's how they talk about you when you're not on their most favorite person's list on any given day too. That's, yeah. that is a dangerous place to be. And what about managing up? So of course we, whether or not people like the, the phrase necessarily, but you have people who need to work with you who are your direct reports. What's about, a, tell me about a time when somebody brought an idea to you, they pitched you something and it just did not go over right. You, you couldn't agree to the pitch. What should they have done differently? If they're gonna bring an idea to you, what, are they, what should they have done? Um, I'm actually going to take this in a little different context. So actually okay. go outside of the business. So we've been on a journey of digitizing our business. So we've been on an 18 month journey doing an overall enterprise architecture and RFP process. And when we were down to two final candidates, a vendor had come in during the RFP process that was just very ill prepared. So we did the right thing and we sent them back home. We gave them an opportunity to come in and redeem themselves. And when they came back, they really missed the mark. Um, going back to leading with negativity or focusing on positivity, their conversations kept pointing back to the shortcomings of their competitor. Mm. While it's important to call out while, while they're different in their value prop, it's not really good to look to spend their time focusing on tearing down the competition and truly selling the value that they were bringing to the table. Uh, in this case, the organization was actually the incumbent. I think they took the relationship for granted. They didn't come to the table prepared to win our business. Mm. Meanwhile, there was a handful of other organizations that went above and beyond focusing on our needs, how they can specifically help us with their solution. And at the end of the day, um, the other competitor beat out the incumbent, mainly focusing really on what we need as an organization. So that's interesting. As far as the... So it was the incumbent vendor, the current vendor for you who took for granted their their incumbency, as it were, their, their current status with you and just thought that all they needed to do was poo-poo their competition and that should be good enough. Just tell you why, they, why you should not change horses midstream, mm -hmm. so to speak. Interesting. Is Do you think that, were they unprepared just because they thought that would be enough? Or do you think there was a different, if actually, let me change that question. If someone, in what way were they unprepared other than just focusing on taking down their competitor? Uh, so again, to go back, it was an 18 month journey where we said it was a, a demo of a software platform. And we mm -hmm. said, here's the scripts we want you to come in and show us. Um, here's the different things and the capabilities that we need to be successful. And they came in and they couldn't even show us, I don't, I don't want to speak out of tongue, but they couldn't show us probably more than 5% of what we asked them to do. Mm. And they were fumbling. They didn't have the process together. So, I mean, on the other side of the table, it looks like, you know, the effort or the care of actually, you know, hearing or listening, it goes back to active listening of actually what we needed as a client that mm -hmm. they weren't really listening to. So it goes back to just that need of listening to what your customers or what your team members may need and you know helping support that. And if it were one of the other vendors uh, who were, had come by to bid and had they been that in uh, ill-prepared, would they have gotten a second chance? Um, probably not. I mean, cause there's a history there. So right. probably not. So you gave them the benefit of the doubt and they still blew mm -hmm. it. So yeah. not surprising that they left. Okay. Then this brings us to the speed round. And these are issues that regularly come up in my training and coaching. And people tend to either feel like these are very black and white and you have to pick one or that they're the only ones who struggle with it. And they're really very, uh, often they'll look at it and assume that there's uh, that these are issues that you would never struggle with because you're already at the top, which means you were just born brilliant and perfect and have no problems that have never struggled through anything. So this is your chance to do a little bit of myth busting and help people mm -hmm. understand that, look, everybody works through some stuff. So first I'm gonna ask you for a real short answer and then I'll prompt you for a little bit more information on each of these topics. Ready? Mm -hmm. First. Let's go. <laughs> Public speaking, love it or hate it? Hate it, but when it's done, it's so rewarding. 
Yes. Yes. And it's funny. The, that's how I feel about running. <laughs> I can't stand it, but I get on the treadmill, not because I like to run because I like having run. Yeah. I like it when it's done. And the only way to get it done is, is to, to start. Exactly. Is to do it, even though I really, really don't want to. So what's a, what's a tip you can give people then for managing nerves and speaking with confidence, even when you don't feel it? Um, prep, I would say take notes and most importantly, consider in advance what questions might be asked of you. Um, also the humanize, so humanize yourself. I would say start out with something engaging or a funny story. And when I think back to the first time I had to present to sales reps, I shared a unique clip from the Planet Earth series. In the video, there was a lizard on a beach that was attempting to dodge what it seemed like hundreds and hundreds of snakes coming at him from oh hundreds of different directions. And if you haven't seen the video, I highly recommend it. So go out on YouTube and look for Planet Earth snakes. I'm sure you'll find it. So I used this video. Um, it was the topic of my presentation. It was about decision making and the different decisions you had to make throughout the course of a year. And the impact it could have on results. The lizard made what it sound, what it felt like hundreds of decisions in really a three-month period and ultimately survived the odds. And I found that this was really a good way to engage the crowd, break the ice, give me comfort, the opportunity to breathe um, um, before speaking, and it worked. Uh, I really got a round of applause for the video and oh, it really humanized it, you know, broke the ice and it was, uh, it was a fantastic uh, presentation. Oh, that's awesome. And actually, I want, I'm going to ask you to share with people, uh, when we talked a couple of days ago uh, in preparation uh, for you to come on the show today, what was your original thought with regard to being up? Because this is your first podcast, right? You hadn't done yes. podcasts before this. What was your original take when I said, hey, Karen, want to do this? I would say, no way, no way, <laughs> no way. And I go back to when you and I uh, first started connecting and you're like, I want to do a Zoom meeting. I don't know if it was Zoom meeting was a thing back then. Yeah, you, and I'm like, years oh. ago. Yeah, and I'm like, let's use FaceTime. And I'm like, you want to do what? And like, it was so uncomfortable, but today it's just so natural. Um, so it's interesting how, you know, how shortly or how quickly things develop. Yeah, video, I mean, I've been using video for years to coach clients who weren't immediately local, and it's always been fun to see what kind of connections you can make with people. And I still remember using it. There was one morning, one day when uh, you had reached out and said, there's this big program, pre big presentation we need tomorrow. Can we talk right away before the meeting? And I said, well, tomorrow I can't you know, the earliest I could meet is, is, you know, eight 30 or nine or something before, because otherwise the nanny's not here yet. And uh -huh. I'm in mommy mode. And you said, I don't care. I'll take it. So I said, all right, <laughs> I don't, I don't, uh, there's, there's no guarantees here. We talk about humanizing these moments. Uh, I said, but if we can meet at eight, my son who, you know, or our sons at that point, who are probably yeah. a year and a half, something like that. I said, he'll be eating breakfast if we're lucky, he'll be quiet with a mouthful of oatmeal and you and I can talk. And so it, we we jumped on the call early and I had my t-shirt on and I had my hair in a ponytail and I'm sitting there at the kitchen table and trying to get oatmeal into my son's face. And uh, you're like, okay, here we go. And we had a total like working mommy bonding moment at that point. Yeah, uh, I'll never forget those, those times. It's those peak <laughs> moments in life. And those are the ones that I think help to build trust among your clients too. It's like, all right, look, I'm going to let you peep behind the curtain a little bit. You're going to see the real person <laughs> behind the role, behind the job de description, behind whatever else it is. And we're going to get this stuff done. And there's just that, that, that extra degree of empathy and personal connection that you build besides just the, the professional respect and trust that you build together. So those, those were fun. Yep, Absolutely. And fortunately, my son's oatmeal stayed mostly in the bowl or on his face, but it did not end up all over the camera. So that was always a good piece. Now, what about the introvert extrovert scale? Where do you fall? Introvert. And as an Definitely. introvert, what's one strength that you have and what's one area that you have to work on? Um, I would say one of my strengths is steadiness. I don't sway in one one direction. I'm even keel. And I don't easily get rattled. Uh, but definitely an area of opportunity is living in the moment, uh, getting out there more. I don't have a lot of time in my schedule to think or reflect. 
And I would say as Ferris Bueller says, life moves pretty fast. So if you don't really stop and look around once in a while, you can really miss it. So I need to spend time focusing, celebrating on success, living in the moment, if it's either with my children or at work or with my team, but it's an, it's a, definitely an opportunity I need to work on. I love that you just quoted Ferris Bueller. That's awesome. <laughs> and finally, handling conflict. Nobody likes it, but when faced with a potential conflict or a difficult conversation of some sort, is your natural DNA hardwiring to want to avoid it at all costs and run away or to dive in and address it head on? Um, I would say, you know, going back to when I was an intern, it was avoid it, avoid it, avoid it, avoid it. But I've learned in my natural instinct, I've groomed myself to address it head on. So conflict is ultimately a good thing. Uh, you want a leadership team, you want a peer team, you want coaches to have a variety of opinions that are passionate about what they do. Um, you know, when you get a group of people in the room that all wants to win, it could become heated, but healthy debates and respectful disagreements can lead to great, great business growth. You know, as my role head of finance, the annual planning process is a natural area for conflict as every business unit is trying to prioritize their plans for their upcoming year, including hiring headcount, marketing spend, and managing the budget set forth by, you know, the organization and our leadership team often puts me in a position of conflict. We can't say yes to everything. So how do we level set between the teams? How do we rank and prioritize? And how do we all come together to achieve the targets that we're looking to achieve? Perfect. I love it. That's, and nobody does like it, but I think that's exactly your point to, to recognize that conflict does not have to include combat, right? And when mm -hmm. you realize that it can be healthy conflict, healthy discussion, and through those disagreements, that's where the best ideas come from. I think that's something that we all need to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. So Karen, how can people learn more about you and Benco? Um, Great question. So if you want to look at our website, you can look at it at www.benco.com. So that's B-E-N-C-O. Or you can follow us on social media. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, but I definitely go point back to our website. Terrific. Thank you so much for coming and letting me be your official podcast host, guinea pig, our show <laughs> being your, your playground and laboratory and joining us on the show today. Thank you for being my laboratory. It was a great, <laughs> uh, great time to spend with you. And thank you everybody out there for listening. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to go to iTunes and give us a five-star rating so that we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my quick start guide to mastering the three C's, command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.